But introducing our speaker for today will be the highlight of this month as far as I'm concerned because Steve's just a phenomenal guy. Uh, if you don't know anything about him or if you don't, know, don't recognize his name, he's been a major league basketball player for about 15 years, I guess it was, maybe from uh, late 70s to early 90s. And he mostly, most during that time, he was a player for Kansas City Royals as well as the uh, New York Yankees. And I think there's a few other trusts in there, but they were short-term uh, assignments or so. But anyway, he's just been a great guy. His, uh, so his, he was known as a hit, uh, home run hitter. And uh, I can't remember exactly, but the numbers were around 450, I think. Anyway, uh, he, can, he can fill in all the details. I don't, I don't have a memory for everything, but uh, the other thing I would say equally as equally as uh, important is that his his involvement. He was a former resident of Berkeley Heights. He now lives in in Watchung with his wife Eve, and uh, his sons. He has three sons, and they're doing all wonderful, great stuff. Uh, I happen to know Steve because my his youngest son and my younger son. We're both best buddies, and uh, as, as somebody was saying, you know, getting a, a major league player to, to provide, you know, a batting instruction would be, well, it's fantastic, you know, and not only that, but it was Steve's humility and humbleness, and he just comes across as a regular guide. So um, with that, I think I'll let Steve uh, take over and give you a little bit of a rundown on some people that he dealt with over the years and, and his a uh, little bit on some specifics of his career. So Steve. Without further ado. Uh, all right. Well, yeah. <laughs> I need notes now. Right? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Larry. Uh, like Larry said, um, his, his youngest son and my, and my youngest son were, were best friends growing up. And um, there was actually five of them that were great friends together. And uh, I guess, Larry, when you were, when they were young, you used to travel a lot and you had a, a big silver briefcase. And I don't know if you knew this, but all the kids were convinced you were a secret agent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to thank the old guard, thank all of you for having me. Um, I have to admit, when Larry asked me, I was, uh, I was a little nervous and Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was a little nervous and intimidated. Uh, nervous because I haven't done this in over 20 years. I think the last time I, I did it was at a baseball banquet, uh, like I said, over 25 years ago. Um, I didn't need notes back then. Now I, I do. Um, a little intimidated because, I mean, you're all successful businessmen, all good education. Um, for me, I played a baseball, I played game for, for a living, you know, a kid's game. Um, my college major was leisure and recreation. Uh, I'm not kidding, it was actually leisure and recreation. Um, I didn't graduate, I ended up signing uh, my junior year. Um, but one thing I, I did, I retired about five years ago and I realized I'm really excellent at leisure and recreation. Um, <laughs> So I think it did come in handy. Um, I'd just like to go over uh, a little bit about my career and how it started. Um, I grew up in New Hampshire, which doesn't sound much like a baseball place, but it, the city I grew up in, Manchester, was a, was a huge baseball town, uh, huge Red Sox fans. Um, but we played, they had Little League, Babe Ruth, American Legion High School. Um, and I played all the way through. Um, when I was eight, uh, I loved baseball from as long as I could remember. Uh, when I was eight, I tried out for Little League and I didn't make it. And I was devastated. Um, I went up in my room and, uh, and just hid. Uh, but it was my father who came up and talked to me, convinced me, we'll work hard and next year you'll be fine. And that's what we did. And the next year I made it. Um, in fact, we went to uh, see a, uh, one of his cousins in Massachusetts and he had two older sons that uh, played baseball and he made this little machine for him, which uh, was just a, a bat with a wire on it uh, connected to a weight through a pulley. And my father saw that and so he made it for me. And 
I loved it. He, my father had no idea what it was going to entail. He, he put the bat on, put the wire, and put some weights on. Um, and then a little while later, a couple months later, he went down in the basement, and there was a big hole in the basement floor from me swinging it. So he figured he better make a better one, so he put it into a pipe. And uh, it was a machine I used uh, actually my whole career. And it was probably a big reason why I was as strong as I was and able to hit the, hit the home runs that I did. Um, but so I, I, owe, I owe him a lot. I owe both my parents a lot. Um, I mean, growing up at uh, baseball, I, I didn't, I knew I was good in New Hampshire, but I, I compared to the rest of the country, I, I had no idea. Um, so I really, after high school, um, my parents owned a, a car wash, and I worked there from when I was little. And I, I figured that was my, my future, was taking over that. Um, then I, I got a call from uh, UNH, uh, University of New Hampshire, to play football and, and baseball. Didn't really want to play football, uh, but I, I figured, okay, you know, I, better than working at a car wash. Uh, but then I got a call from uh, the coach of Eckerd College. His name was Bill Livesey. It's a small school in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but it was one of the top Division II baseball uh, schools in, in the country. Um, he invited me down to visit. I went down there, and um, it was amazing to me. I, I've never seen a baseball practice the way he did it. Um, it was organized. It was so much information. Uh, he actually taught me the game of baseball, how it should be played, how to get better at it. And I decided right away that I wanted to go, and my parents um, were okay with it, even though they had to pay for it. Um, so I ended up going there. Um, it was a, like I said, it was a Division II school. And while I was there, the three years I was there, it was we were one of the top school uh, schools in the country. Um, it was the first time I had any dealings with scouts or or anybody you know like that. It was the first time I got to see a comparison of players that got drafted or players from all over the country and to, com to be able to compare myself to, to how good they were. And it was, um, it was a great experience. And um, in fact, we used to play uh, Division I schools too. We played the University of Miami. And one year we played the University of South Carolina who were ranked second in the, in the nation. And it was funny because uh, a, a pitcher, Ed Lynch, who, who ended up being a GM, and uh, he would always, when, when I'd see him, he'd always talk to me about, they came down to play us, and they were the number two team in the country, and they thought they were just gonna kill this little school, and we ended up beating them pretty bad, and he, he, keeps, <laughs> he keeps talking about it. But it was a lot of fun, um, and I did, I learned a lot. Um, we used to play a lot of schools from up north, which really wasn't fair because, I mean, we played, you know, all, all season long. We played 40 games in the fall, 25 in the spring, and then 40-something during the season. So these teams would come down from, from the northeast. It'd be their first time outside, and they'd be playing us, and they didn't really have much of a chance. They'd have all the white stuff on their nose and from the sun. And... Um, but it was funny because uh, about 10, 12 years ago, I, I, I needed back surgery. And so I went to Columbia Presbyterian and met the doctor there. And he walks in the room and I said, you know, nice to meet you. He goes, oh, we've met before. And I said, I said we have. And he said, he said yeah, I went, to, I went to school at Columbia University. I played baseball there. He goes, we came down and played you guys at Eckerd College. <laughs> He goes, you guys killed us. He goes, you called us Poindexters. <laughs> so this guy was going to have a, um, you know, a power tool next to my spine. <laughs> so I have, of course, I had to apologize. I blamed it on the other players, of course. Um, but it all turned out well. He was, he did a great job. Um, so. Uh, we, we, we actually, my second year, we ended up going to the World's, uh, the Division II World Series. 
Uh, we didn't end up winning, but that's where I, I really got to talk to a lot of scouts, uh, Red Sox, the Mets, uh, and, and a few others. Um, but it wasn't after my third year was the, it was the Yankees that, that ended up drafting me in the second round, um, which I was really excited about. The rest of my family weren't very happy, but, <laughs> but I was very excited. And uh, I went to Yankee Stadium and they, uh, they made me an offer and my great bargaining skills, I got a couple thousand dollars more, um, realizing I needed an agent uh, desperately. But it, it worked out great. I ended up signing with the Yankees and it was a, it was a great opportunity and they were a great, um, a great team. Um, my first year, it started out, uh, started out a little, a little rough. It was, it was hard adjusting from an aluminum bat to a, uh, to a wooden bat. I, uh, when, uh, in 1976, uh, there, there was a strike year and the Pittsburgh Pirates and the St. Louis Cardinals worked out at Eckerd College uh, in the morning. And Willie Stargell was there and he, instead of using his wooden bats for batting practice, he had Alcoa Company make him a big aluminum bat and had Alcoa written on the front. And when they left, he left it there. And so I took it and used it and it was the greatest thing. And so when I got to, um, to the Yankees, they had wooden bats and they weren't very big. So I had a, I had a hard time. His, his bat was 36 inches long. And I think the longest bat that, that my first year was like 34 inches and it was a lot lighter. Um, so I did struggle trying to figure out what bat I could use. And, um, and it really wasn't until double A uh, when I played in Nashville, when I, I had a contract with Louisville, um, Louisville Slugger, they, uh, they made the bat I wanted, which was 36, 36 inches. And the rep told me, if you get the same weight, then the wood will be better. So I said, all right, we'll make it 36 ounces then. So that's what I used. And I, I had a good year that year. And I was, uh, I realized, okay, I need to, I need to use a big bat. In fact, the next year I said, make it 38 ounces, I'll get better wood. <laughs> But um, after, uh, after that year, uh, 1981 was my first spring training. Um, it was uh, Bob Watson and Jim Spencer were the first basemen. So I wasn't gonna play, it was just, I was there, I was on the 40 man roster, so they, you know, I got to go there, I had to stay there a certain amount of time. And uh, it was great, I was, Bob Watson and Jim's both older players would play one or two innings and I'd play the rest. And it, it was, it was just the greatest time. And at the end they went and played a, a three game series in, uh, in New Orleans and they took me along, even though I wasn't going to play and I was going to get sent down. And it was, it was just the best time. The, the Yankees were, were great to me. Um, but during that year I did, uh, Bob Watson got hurt and I did get called up and before this, uh, Phil Rizzuto and Frank Messer um, really took a liking to me, and they would put my name on the scoreboard at Yankee Stadium. They would talk about me on the radio. And uh, so my first day up, um, it was pretty crazy. Uh, everyone knew who I was, and of course they were expecting a lot. Um, it, it, was, it was pretty, pretty crazy. Um, my locker was right next to Reggie Jackson. So... <laughs> So needless to say, after a game, I had to go in the players' lounge and get it and drink for a while because I couldn't get anywhere near my locker. Um, but it was funny, Reggie, the first game, we were facing a left-handed pitcher who was also a rookie who I had faced quite a few times in the minor leagues. So Reggie asked me, um, what does he throw? So he's a left-handed pitcher. He, has, he throws, you know, fastball, curveball, changeup. And... Uh, that's what he threw me. Of course, when Reggie got up there, he threw them all sliders. <laughs> so needless to say, Reggie never asked me a, a, a picture again. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it, it was a great experience. I, I, got, I got to play in two games. Um, my first at bat, 
was, believe it or not, was a triple. Um, it was the first time I realized uh, Yankee Stadium is not a fun place. Uh, I hit it about 425 feet and it hit the fence. And I was like, but um, I played uh, that game and then uh, one more game in Detroit and then I got sent down. Um, I got called up at the end. Um, so the next year, I was really thought I would have a chance. Um, I had a good year in AAA, so I was excited to go into next spring. And George Steinbrenner signed uh, Dave Collins to play first base. He wanted more speed. So I get to spring training, and I don't suit up at all. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was working out with the pitchers. I, I would go to practice in the morning. Um, I would take batting practice, do what they did, and then the pitchers who weren't pitching would leave. And everyone else would go in, suit up for the game, and sit on, you know, sit on the bench or play. I didn't sit on, I didn't suit up, I didn't sit on the bench. <laughs> I guess George Steinbrenner didn't want any chance of me doing well um, after he just signed Dave Collins to a big contract. So, I, I didn't play at all. We used to have B games once in a while in the morning, and they put me in one B game. I hit a home run, and I never, I never saw the field again. Um, he finally called me in his office and told me he thought I needed another year of AAA. So um, not what I – I just sat there and didn't say anything. He was – he held the cards to my future, but there were a few things I wanted to say, but I didn't. Um, but it, it all turned out well at the rest uh, after that season. I, I mean, uh, during that season, I got called up two or three times. I, I probably played half the season in the major leagues. Um, they like taking me on the road against left-handed pitchers. Um, one time they called me up. I was in playing in Toledo, Ohio, and they called that night and said, you have to be in New York tomorrow morning. So I had to, I, I had to get, catch like a 5 o'clock uh, playing out of um, Toledo to Pittsburgh. And so I get in and I, I hardly have any sleep. So I lay on the sofa in the player's lounge and fall asleep. And I wake up and all of a sudden there's Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle, Whitey Ford. And it's like, you know, I think I'm, I'm dreaming. Would I die and go to baseball heaven? Or no one told me it was old timers day that day. <laughs> So, yeah, I was sound asleep on the, on the sofa, and they were all in their uniforms walking around looking at me. But, but it was a great experience to be around them. Um, my third year was with Billy Martin. I get a lot of people ask me about Billy Martin. Um, all I can really say is if he liked you, you were good. If he didn't, uh, watch out. Um, I remember Larry Milburn was a second baseman. He was a utility player. And Billy Martin put the squeeze on, and Larry was at, at the plate, and they pitched out. And Larry didn't throw his bat at the ball. He reached, but he didn't throw his bat at the ball. And Larry Milborn never stepped on the field again <laughs> with Billy Martin. So it was, uh, he was a little different. But I have to say, as far as strategy, uh, as far as making sure people were in the right place, he, he, he was always, uh, you know, ahead of the other manager. As far as managing a game, I don't, I don't know if there was anyone better. Um, during that year, I was also involved in the, the big Pintar game. Um, so I was with the Yankees at the time. Uh, we, we had played them the week before in Kansas City. And George Brett uh, got up to the plate and everyone was, and there was mention in his bat. So look at that Pintar. So they decided, okay, we're gonna wait. Let's wait till he does something before we, we say anything. So we, we don't, no one says anything. We go back uh, to, to Yankee Stadium and sure enough, you know, we're winning uh, in the ninth inning and George gets up, hits a two run homer off Goose. And that's, you know, that's, uh, Billy Martin goes out, says, look at the bat. They measure the bat and they called him out. I didn't know George at the time, but sitting over there, 
I swore he was going to hit him. I, he came running out of that dugout. I thought for sure he was going to hit him. And uh, it, it, was, it was crazy. Um, of course, you know, it was George Brett, so they did change the rules, and they went back, and um, they, we, we ended up losing because they, they did call it a home run. Um, but it was funny because later on I was traded to Kansas City and uh, ended up over there, and then I knew George, so I, I knew he wouldn't hit him. But I also knew why his pine tar was so he, he, he didn't use gloves, so he'd, when he put the donut on the bat, he had all the pine tar in the hand of the, the donut would bring the pine tar to the, up too high to the bat. So he wasn't trying to cheat or anything. It was just the way, it, you know, the way he, he did it. But, um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was quite an experience. Um, my time in Kansas City, it, it, was, it was hard getting traded because I love the Yankees. Um, to me, there was no better organization, no other organization that I wanted to play with. And when I got to Kansas City, I, I was pleasantly surprised. It was also a very good organization, wanted to win, great people, great veterans. Um, it, was, it, it was really a great experience, and I found that I was really happy to be there. Uh, unfortunately, the ballpark wasn't great either, but it was... Uh, it was a beautiful ball, but it was just big, you know, and I, I liked smaller. Um, but uh, it, it was, the first year was a little tough because we, they had just got over the drug scandal uh, in 1983. A lot of guys ended up caught with drugs, and uh, they really kind of cleaned house. But they kept the core veterans, and it was, uh, it was just a great group of guys and, uh, and a mix of young players, especially the pitching staff. Um, and that year, we ended up making it to the playoffs and the, in, in 1984. Um, it was just a great team, and it was a close team. I mean, the Yankees, they were all great guys. Um, but, and usually, you could, you could hang out with whoever you wanted. There would be guys going to one place, guys going to another, and you could, you could jump on with anybody. But this team, it was like everybody did things together. Um, I, my, my oldest son was two years old, and so I, we were having a birthday party for him, and I just walk in the clubhouse and I invite everybody. Um, all we had, we just had a little two-bedroom apartment, and uh, they all showed up, you know, <laughs> with their kids. It's like, you know, it was crazy. Um, and it, it was a fun, we, it was a, we, were, we liked to gamble. It was a lot of gambling, no baseball. We, no one bet on baseball, but we bet on everything else. Uh, golf, horse racing, car racing. We played cards. We played cards on the plane a lot. Um, with the charter flights, you could basically do whatever you wanted. So we would uh, yeah, we'd play cards. Um, in fact, uh, it was, this was a long time ago. Kansas City didn't have, they didn't have a TV or anything in the, in the clubhouse. Uh, they finally put cable in, in one of the rooms. So there was one TV in the cable. And they just happened to have the dog races on right before the game. So right before the game, you'd have half the team would be in that little room watching the dog betting on them. But, um, but it, was, it, it was a lot of fun. We had a, we had a great time. Um, and then uh, the, the following year was 1985, which is when we won the World Series. And it, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was surprising uh, because... We were still, we were a young team, and there were so many good teams. Uh, the, the whole East, I mean, the Yankees, the Toronto, um, Detroit, Baltimore. I, I, I think if we were in the American League East, we probably would have been in last place. Um, but because it was just the East and the West, um, we ended up playing really well the second half of the season and ended up winning the division. And... Um, it was amazing. Toronto had a great team that year. We were down two nothing, and we just somehow came back. Um, that's when I first realized when you went into playoffs, it's pitching. And we had some great young pitchers: Brett Saberhagen, Danny Jackson, Mark Gubaza, and that's and that's how we won. And we came back and beat them. And then St. Louis, who probably even had, might have had a better team. Um, we did the same thing. Our pitchers were outstanding, and we just we did a really good job uh, playing against them. We were down early, and we came back. Um, 
course, everyone complains about that one call, but um, you know, that's, that's how it is in baseball. In fact, later on in my career, I worked for St. Louis and they still haven't got over it. <laughs> but I did show them the ring though, so. But uh, that was probably my best year playing um, until 86. 86, I was actually having a better year, but I hurt my back um, in, late, in the middle of August. And I kind of made the mistake of going, I, I, I tried to uh, take batting practice and I couldn't do it. So they sent me to a doctor out in California and he immediately said I needed surgery and that uh, you know, my back was in bad shape, I needed surgery. So they flew me back to Kansas City. I saw a couple specialists and it turns out I didn't need surgery, but I, I, I didn't play the rest of the season and the next year, I think it scared the Royals and I ended up, uh, as, instead of playing first, they end, I ended up as a DH. And it kind of went downhill from there. I, I ended up platooning and, uh, and in 1988, they let me go in, um, in the middle of the season and I went to Seattle. Um, Seattle um, was, it was a horrible team. <laughs> it was great young players, but it was just so poorly run and they just, they were just terrible. Uh, it was this big um, dome and maybe 500, 600 people, <laughs> you know, you, you could hear a pin drop and it was like this, except when the Yankees came in. Um, but it, it was, it, it rejuvenated my career. Um, I got to play there and uh, the first baseman got hurt. Uh, not, not long after I was there, I got to play like three weeks in a row first base and they eventually traded their DH um, and had me DH the rest of the season. So it really worked out well for me. And, but I, they, uh, the, the Royals had cut my salary um, down to, you know, uh, as something to, as a part-time player would get. And Seattle, you know, kept it, wanted to keep it the same. So we ended up going arbitration. Um, I ended up winning, which they were not happy about at all. So they brought it, they had a new manager, he brought in someone else, and they were all ready to release me. And in the contract, in the players contract, if you, you can't release someone for winning at arbitration. So the players association was there, they were all ready to fight, you know, with them and everything. So we were, they were talking to me about it. And uh, so, but they ended up trading me back to the Yankees. So, um, which was, I was so happy about. Um, Don Mattingly's back was bothering him and they wanted someone to help him out at first base and, you know, and uh, be a platoon DH. Um, Frank Howard was with C uh, um, Seattle when I was there. And then he was, he went to, um, to the Yankees. One of the nicest guys I've ever met in the game. Just a great guy. One of the biggest too. I mean, this was a big human being. Um, he was six, eight, six, nine, um, just huge. But I owed him a lot because I, I didn't have a lot of experience playing part-time and he really helped me. He would say, let's go in the cage, get some swings. You have to be ready. And um, he just made me work. He made me work hard and it, it really paid off. And I really, I really owe him a lot, just a, a great guy. Um, those years going back were not very good for the Yankees. Uh, it was the year George Steinbrenner got thrown out of baseball, all the problems um, that they had. In fact, I think there's a documentary out about those, those years. Um, one of the stories was Mel Hall. Um, it was funny, uh, the year before, Mel was with Cleveland and I was with Kansas City and a good friend of mine, Jamie Quirk, was also with Kansas City. And we ended up having a fight um, uh, with Cleveland. Uh, they hit one of our guys, we hit one of theirs, and both benches emptied, and here comes Mel Hall running out of the dugout. He had been out of the game. He's in gym shorts, and, and he's looking to hit somebody. And so he, he ended up going after my friend, Jamie Quirk. So, I go after him, so he's grabbed Jamie, I have him by the neck, and we all fall. And, you know, in fact, they ended up taking a picture of it, and it's, it's, 
it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty funny, but the next year, Mel gets traded to the Yankees, Jamie Quirk gets traded to the Yankees, and they're there, and right at the, before spring training starts, I get traded to the Yankees. So Jamie walked over to Mel and said, hey Mel, my bodyguard's coming. <laughs> But it, it, turned out, it turned out really well. Uh, we all got along great. There was no problem. But Mel did have some issues. Um, he, was, he was dating a 16-year-old girl who the, her parents were taking her to the ballpark. In fact, I think he ended up living at their house for a while. So uh, that was a crazy story. But then, then he goes and buys two cougars. And he brought them into the clubhouse once. And, I have to say they were adorable, but they were wild animals. <laughs> they, were, they were pretty big. And uh, needless to say, where he was staying, they eventually call, um, someone called, and you can't have wild animals in a, in a little town in Connecticut. So um, they ended up taking it away from him. But um, yeah, it, it was an experience um, w with him. Um, my last year, 91, I ended up um, getting released by the Yankees. Um, Japan had been interested in me for a while, and I, uh, I didn't really want to go over there right, if, as long as I had a chance to play in this country, but they, uh, uh, they showed a lot of interest, and then when I did get released, they wanted me to go over. So I was, I was going over, I was planning on going over there the next year. In fact, I, I agreed to go to uh, Texas's minor league team in Oklahoma City just to let them know that I could still play and they were happy about it and everything. And then all of a sudden in November, I'm waiting to hear from Japan in November, I see that the team I was, that, that was interested in me was uh, signed somebody else. And so I, I called my agent, he didn't know what happened. So I ended up not going. Um, the next year, my agent had gone out to California. And so I got an agent who dealt with Japan and he told me I was blackballed in Japan. <laughs> so I still don't know why. It might have been something my agent did or didn't do. Um, but as far as Japan went, they wanted no part of me. <laughs> and I had no idea why. But so that was pretty much the end. I, I played a couple more years at Texas, uh, at Oklahoma City. And, um, and it, it was a great experience because I was working with a lot of young kids and I was helping them out and it was where I realized that I enjoyed coaching. So I started, um, I, I came home and spent a few years with my kids uh, trying to coach them. Uh, they were the toughest. Um, yeah, anything I said, I'm not doing that. It's a, yeah, yeah, I'm lying to you because I want you to be terrible. But, but the good news is my oldest son, my grandson does the same thing to him, so. Now he knows how it feels. But, um, but I coached for a few years off and on. And, and then uh, in uh, 2009, I called a friend of mine who I grew up with, Brian Sabian, who was the GM for San Francisco. And he asked me to do scout, to, to, if I'd like to try scouting. So I, I said, oh, okay, I'll try it. So he had me uh, scouting in, in the, this area, which was nice. Not, I didn't have to travel a lot. Um, I didn't, didn't enjoy it very much because I was writing reports on players and um, it, was, it was a lot of work and I wasn't sure what I was doing. Um, and so I did that for a year. And then the next year he asked me to do the advanced scouting. Uh, with a friend of mine. And so we did it together and that I really enjoyed. And I ended up doing that for 11 years, which was traveling around to the teams that we were playing before we played them. And then just going over each player, how they, you know, how they were doing, you know, weaknesses, strengths, weaknesses. And uh, it was just, a, it was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed it. Um, and then things changed, uh, baseball changed, the analytics came in and, um, I'm not a big fan, so I, I probably won't be saying anything nice about analytics. Um, but yeah, my job was eliminated uh, for a 22 year old kid on a computer. But um, you know, it, it, it all worked out. I had a great career. It was, 
I was about ready to retire anyway, so um, I retired then and uh, and just moved on. So, like I said, I'm really good at leisure and recreation, so it worked out good. Um, so um, I hope I didn't bore you too much, but uh, I'd like to, you know, if you have any questions, I know, you know, uh, I forget a lot of stories and stuff. But thank you. So you know what to do, guys. Questions, comments, come on up. Mort, it looks like you're first. Can you tell us about your nickname, Bye Bye Balboni? Was that a creation of Frank Messer or one of those guys? No. <laughs> oh, actually, I, yeah, I should have brought that up. It was actually Eckerd College. Um, the St. Petersburg Times did an article on me, and that was the headline. Uh, bye bye Balboni. I, I forget what the whole thing was. And when I went to Nashville, they picked it up and they started calling me that. And that's when Frank Messer and Phil Rizzuto started uh, talking about it too. But it actually started in college uh, from an article. What stole my question? I always thought it was Sterling that called you that for the Yankees. But uh, my question is, uh, you didn't play in, this, in the steroid area, uh, maybe touched on it, but what do you think about the people that are caught up in that? Uh, Barry Bonds and McGuire and A-Rod and Sosa. Do you think that they should be in the Hall of Fame? Do you think there's a stigma even now and did you ever play against Pete Rose? And do you think that he was the greatest singles hitter that ever played the game and he should be in the Hall of Fame? Okay, uh, good questions. I'll, I'll answer the Pete Rose thing first. Uh, now when you watch any sports, including baseball, there's all the ads for, for betting, online betting, you know. It's like, at this point, you really need to let him in. Um, and what he did, he didn't do it as a player. Um, and his accomplishments as a player um, really should have nothing to do with what he did later as a coach. Um, you know, it was a problem. They let guys with drugs in. I mean, he had a problem. You know, people have drug problems. They let those guys in. Um, I definitely think. I, I, I feel like they will. I'm just afraid they're going to do it after he dies, which I think is a horrible thing. Um, but as far as the steroids go, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I think there are a few guys that are in the Hall of Fame that did it that they just didn't catch. Um, it was an incredible drug. Um, I never did it. Um, with my heart history, I probably wouldn't be here if I did. Uh, but it was an incredible drug, and it, 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 it actually probably helped pitchers more than anybody. Um, it was amazing how pitchers could throw harder. And there were a lot of good pitchers who didn't throw that hard, who had great command and, and knew how to pitch, um, took steroids. And I mean, all of a sudden you're throwing, you know, five, six, seven, eight miles an hour harder with, with good stuff. And now all of a sudden, instead of, you know, playing your minor league career, you're in the, you're in the major leagues. I mean, I was coaching with St. Louis and there was a guy that got released um, from, uh, from Montreal, and we picked him up, um, and he they sent him to A ball. And when we saw him in spring training, he was throwing about you know 85 miles an hour at the most. And he goes to A ball, and then I'll, I'm coaching Double A at the time. And then we call him up, and he comes up to Double A, and he's throwing 91, and he has a great slider. And it was like. <laughs> He ended up in the big leagues from getting released, and it was and it was pretty obvious that it wasn't, you know, it, that it was steroids. And there were quite a few guys on that team that that actually did it. Um, there was no proof, but it is pretty obvious when all of a sudden you're throwing harder than you ever threw before. You know, it just doesn't happen. I mean, like Roger Clemens. I mean, you know. 10 years, you know, after pitching for 10 years, he's throwing harder than he did when he was 21. It's, you know, something's, something's wrong, you know. 
I mean, Nolan Ryan threw 95, but he was throwing 105. So, <laughs> so he lost, you know, he lost my, so he didn't, he wasn't doing it. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's hard. It's a hard thing to do because I do think there are some that got away with it. So, but it was cheating, definitely. Thank you. I just thoroughly enjoyed your discussion. I want to tell you two questions. Uh, who is the toughest pitcher that you ever faced? And secondly, this analytical question about this lefty righty situation, you as a successful batter, did you feel comfortable facing left handed pitchers and right handed pitchers? Or is that, you know, is that something you think there's just too much analytics associated with it? Well, well, there's there's way too much analytics. <laughs> um, it it can be it can be a tool, but it's not an important tool. I mean, they'll give you a list of of players. Okay, he does this against this pitcher. Well, if you've seen the guy play enough, it's obvious if the guy has trouble hitting a pitcher, or if a pitcher has trouble getting a batter out. I mean, you don't need their numbers to see that and if you haven't if it hasn't been that much those numbers don't mean anything i mean if a guy faces a pitcher three times th those numbers don't mean anything so it, it's really i i don't know I, to me it was the biggest scam in baseball but um <laughs> in sports actually um i'm sorry what was the first question the, first, the, toughest, pitcher. the toughest pitcher i get that asked a lot it's really a tough it's a tough question because every baseball every day is different um and there were some really great pitchers and when they were on they were extremely tough um the one i had the most trouble with was probably clemens um he knew where my weakness was and he he could hit it every time <laughs> pretty much so i did i struck out a lot against him um in fact hal mccray was uh was my lo was ne the locker next to mine um, and even on the road we would lock next to each other uh, he was basically my hitting coach uh, well, my time with the yankees and i would strike out and hal mccray would buy me a bottle of dom perignon champagne <laughs> from my hundred strikeout okay so when i hit a hundred he, he'd put the champagne in my locker so we go into boston and i have 96 strikeouts Clemens is pitching, and I walk in, and there's the bottle of champagne in my locker. So, and unfortunately, I did open it after the game. So. Any other? Do we have online questions? We don't? Hey, come on, guys. There must be more questions. I know you've got more. Uh, here comes... Here comes Larry, and here comes Doug Garno. Good, let's keep going. Okay, just a short story I wanted to tell about Steve. So Steve was um, an assistant coach uh, all during um, our, my younger son's baseball playing days, primarily the ones in, in junior high school and also elementary school. And uh, so I remember we were, I don't have the exact details, but we were playing a, a, a tournament, which was a multi-day tournament, down in somewhere down in the shore area. And so when, you know, when the, the fathers on the other team realized that who Steve was, you know, it was, just wasn't your ordinary uh, hitting coach or assistant coach, they all had their sons tell their sons to get Steve's autograph on the second day when, you know, when they were playing, uh, playing the, next, the next game. And sure enough, yeah, so, uh, you know, all these kids come trotting over and, and they all want, uh, you know, Mr. Balboni's signature or autograph. And of course, the kids on our team are saying, oh, what's, what's the big deal? I mean, he's just, he's just Mr. Balboni to us. <laughs> so I know that one thing not related to Steve was the, the remark that he was making about my, my, my uh, briefcase. <laughs> yeah, the kid, all of the kids, including his son, probably more than anybody else, thought that I had nuclear launch codes inside <laughs> of it. But... <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Hi, my name is Doug Garner. Uh, did you own the Murray Hill Country Club? 
<laughs> was that your residence or what? Yes, it was. Yeah, do you know, remember anything about the history of the club? Um, well, my wife has all the information. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, um, it was a clothing dealer or something from New York built it, and it was the first house built there. Oh. Uh, he had a wife and three daughters. Um, yeah, they, they lived there, I don't know how long, and then it became the, the Murray Hill Country Club. It, yeah. became, it was two golf I courses, was I think, one course closed, there, and they yeah. opened it again. Kind of a funny story, uh, I was in Kansas City and we were planning on moving back to New Jersey. Um, so um, my wife came back to visit her family. I was still working and she, she came back and stayed for like four or five days. And so she said, you know, I'll look for areas where we might look for a house. So I said, yeah, you know, look around, see, see what you find. So she calls me and says, I found the house. I said, you weren't looking for a house. You were looking for an area. We're not. And she goes, I found the house. So she sends me a video. She is in love with this house. So she comes home. She convinces me to make an offer. So I said, okay. So we make a crummy offer. They took it. So, so now I'm moving. To, I haven't even seen the house yet. So we're moving. Well, my, I'm, I'm on the road with... Uh, on, uh, playing and the friends of mine around we get to the hotel and there's an envelope waiting for me so I open the envelope and a couple of my friends are standing there behind me I pull it out and it says there's a picture of the house and it says Murray Hill Country Club <laughs> and all the guys behind me go damn you're buying a golf course <laughs> I said no I, don't, I didn't think I was but Have you attended any old timers games and do you have any uh, memories you could share about uh, with some of the players? Yeah, um, I, I used to go uh, before I started working a lot. I was I, I did I did a lot of stuff with the Yankees. Um, I did uh, I, I was around Joe Pepitone quite a bit um, doing things with him, uh, doing events with him, which was the I've never laughed so hard in my whole life. Um, we did a we did a, a a camp at Yankee Stadium, and all these kids are you know sitting around and they're doing we're doing a little talk, and one of the kids asked Joe Pepitone who was your uh, who's your hero growing up, and Joe says John Gotti. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, needless to say, the, the Yankees were very careful with him, but, um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed going uh, to the old timers day. Um, now there's so many people, I, I, I was working, I wasn't able to do it uh, the 11 years I was, I was scouting. So I, I did go the first year it was at the new stadium. I did do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, hopefully I'll get invited back at some point. Um, I don't think I can play anymore, that's for sure. Uh, physically, I don't think I could swing a bat or anything. But, um, yeah, they were, a lot, they were a lot of fun. It's a little different than it used to be. I mean, now the, the, the old timers are in a different locker room and everything, where when I played, like I said, I woke up. They were, you know, each guy was in, you know, there was a guy in your locker you got to talk to him. It was just, it was, it was a great thing. It was a great relationship. My name is Edward Atkin. What do you think of the Yankees' policy on facial hair banning beards? <laughs> 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 they were the only team. Well, so what was yeah. the farthest you hit a home run? Was the distance for you? Oh, they didn't. They didn't measure back then. There was there was no measurements. But um, yeah, I, I hit some long ones. Um, yeah, the well, it was George Steinbrenner. I mean, I, I have to admit, we always looked first class. Um, they now they would allow mustaches, but in the minor leagues, there was no facial hair at all, and you had to wear your pants a certain way and. Uh, yeah, there was a there were a lot of rules how you had to look, and uh, honestly, I, I don't think it was a bad thing. I think it, it showed discipline, and 
it, it showed a lot of class. And I think that, that was the biggest thing with the Yankees is it was a first class organization and they were very classy. It was one of the things I think George Steinbrenner did right. I, I, one more, I, I remember someone asked him about, you know, putting the names on the, on the back of the jersey. And I remember him saying, he goes, there's only one name that means anything, and that's the one on the front. So he was a big Yankee fan, and he, he really, the, the team meant a lot to him. You know, about uniforms, uh, we're, we're a first class organization here. Uh, your uniforms will be issued next week. Um, uh, I think we've run out of questions, uh, which surprises me, but Larry, come on up and thank our speaker. Yeah, I hope you've all enjoyed it. Uh, Steve's a great guy. Um, even <laughs> He'd be a great guy just based on his involvement with the kids over the years here in town. So um, a lot of the kids earned, got a lot of extra out of it because of Steve's input. So uh, as we know, our, our practice in the uh, old guard is to uh, uh, is to honor our, our presenters by uh, having a certificate, which we have here. And also we have a, something called the Old Guard Salute. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.